Hello, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Hilary Alcott. I am the Associate Curator in the Department of the Arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. And I am the Coordinating Curator for the De Young Museum's presentation of Frida Kahlo, Appearances Can Be Deceiving. Now this was already a very special exhibition, but it has been made even more special by the fact that we finished installing it just days before the shelter in place order was enacted. So only myself and a few of my colleagues have been able to see it yet. And we're so excited to be able to share it with all of you. We're really looking forward to that day. So keep your eye on the De Young Museum's website and uh, that way you can find out more information about when the museum and the exhibition will open and also you can find out more information about how you can secure your ticket. But in the meantime, thank you for tuning in for this uh, curatorial discussion and uh, drawing workshop. Before I say a few more words about that, I would like to take a moment and just say a huge thank you to all of our exhibition sponsors. John A. and Cynthia Frygun, Diane B. Wilsey, the Harris Family, the Bernard Osher Foundation, the Michael Taylor Trust, Ray and Dagmar Dolby Family Fund, Janet Barnes and Thomas W. Weisel Family, George and Marie Heckscher, Susie and Fred Harburg, Alec and Gail Merriam, Paul A. Vilich, and Aero Mexico. I would also like to express my extreme gratitude to all of our exhibition lenders, with special thanks to the Banco de Mexico, Diego Rivera, and Frida Kahlo Museums Trust. So today we will be having a digital curator conversation, a discussion between Circe Henestrosa, our guest curator, and Gani Ankori, advising curator. Uh, this will be about 45 minutes long, and then one of our teaching artists, Rafael Naz, will lead us in an ex photo drawing workshop. And that'll be about 25 minutes, and um, we'll give you a few minutes in between the two so you can gather all of your art supplies up. Before we begin, I'll just say a few words of introduction about Circe and Gani. Cersei Henestrosa is an independent fashion curator from Mexico. She is now based in Singapore, where she is the head of fashion at LaSalle College of the Arts. She curated the special exhibition, Appearances Can Be Deceiving, The Dresses of Frida Kahlo at the Museo Frida Kahlo in Mexico City. And then she co-curated the uh, critically renowned special exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London entitled Frida Kahlo making herself up. And so we're so delighted that she is the guest curator of the exhibition, Frida Kahlo Appearances Can Be Deceiving at the De Young Museum. Ganit Ankori is a professor of fine arts and of women, gender, and sexuality studies at Brandeis University. As of July 1st, she will also be taking on the role of interim director and chief curator of the Rose Art Museum. So congratulations on that, Ganit. And she is uh, internationally renowned for her groundbreaking scholarship on Frida Kahlo. Her numerous books and articles have been published around the world in multiple languages. And she has collaborated with Circe on projects in London, New York, and of course now San Francisco. She's acting as our advising curator and we're so delighted to have her involved in the project. So with that, I will turn it over to Circe and Ganit. I hope that you all enjoy and thank you for tuning in. So today we want to take you on a personal journey through the life of this important artist and her connection to the wonderful city of San Francisco. That's right. And as we embark on this uh, journey, Circe, I wonder if we could begin with your personal family connection to this project and to Frida Kahlo. One of my most favorite photographs in this exhibition is this one, Reunion in San Angel. And Circe, can you walk us through it, please? Um, yeah, thank you, Ganit. Actually, when I started this research, I was interested in the disability and ethnicity aspects of Kahlo's personal archive and her wardrobe and how these two related with each other from the beginning of the project. Um, so I started with the ethnicity part. I wanted to know why Kahlo had chosen this specific dress as her logo, and I'll tell you why. Because I have a personal connection to this dress as I am a wearer of this dress. My family on my father's side comes from the Tehuantepec Isthmus, which is a matriarchal society located in the southeast part of Mexico, where women administrate the society and all the women dressed in this Tewana attire. 
So they are called Tewadas because they come from the Tehuantepec Isthmus. So my great uncles were close friends to Diego Rivera and, and Frida Kahlo back in the 20s and 30s. They were part of the circle of intellectuals. And my aunt Alfa, who was an indigenous woman from Tehuantepec, gave Frida some of her first Tehuana dresses. So there are scholars who say that Alfa and Nereida, my aunties, used to bring Frida these Oaxacan pieces from Tehuantepec. So here in this photo taken by Nicholas Murray um, back in 1938 in Mexico City, we see this group that includes my aunts. From left, we see Alfa, Alfa Rios Enestrosa, Nereida Rios, Rosa Covarrubias, Diego Rivera, Nicholas Murray, then we see Miguel Covarrubias, and finally Frida Kahlo. Wow, what a crowd. And it's such an honor to be working with you, uh, Circe, and, you know, an indigenous Mexican fashion curator who knows this uh, material inside out. Um, as we looked at the photograph, uh, Circe and I noticed that uh, Circe's aunt, Narita, is wearing the very same skirt that Kala would wear the following year when she posed for Nicholas Murray in New York, as you can see in this slide. At this point, Circe, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about the great discovery in 2004. Um, yeah, so here what we see on this slide is the, the Blue House, today the Frida Kahlo Museum. And this is the place where Frida Kahlo was born in 1907, lived and died. So here we see Kahlo in her room lying on her bed. And this is a physical space where in April 2004, Carlos wardrobe was discovered in the bathroom adjacent to her room. So it was this bathroom that kept the objects of her wardrobe for more than 50 years. So it had been closed first by orders of her husband, Diego Rivera, and later on by Dolores Olmedo, who was a collector and friend of the artist. Wow. Can you elaborate on what exactly was found in this incredible trove? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, there, there were 22,000 documents, around 6,000 photographs of, of, of the artist, and 300 personal objects of, of Rita Kahlo. So her wardrobe is mostly composed of traditional Mexican pieces from Oaxaca and beyond. And, uh, and really, there are also some ethnic garments from Guatemala and China, as well as some interesting examples of European and American blouses. So apart from that, um, we have her jewelry, accessories, orthopedic devices, and shoes and makeup. But can it, among her clothes, though, as we were discussing, it was the Tijuana dress that Carlo chose as her signature look. And, and this is really shown in her wardrobe because we found um, nearly 16 Tijuana blouses and around 25 original Tijuana skirts, and some of them sewn and personalized by, by, by Kahlo. Yeah, and we also have her sewing uh, kit in the exhibition. Um, so if we move to the photographs, one of the most... Uh, I think interesting photographs that was found in 2004, actually you chose to open our exhibition. Can you explain what we see here? Yes, um, actually, yeah, this is a very um, important photograph because many scholars said that Carlo used to wear this dress to please Diego Rivera. And where the water was open, um, an image of her maternal family reappeared, which is the image um, we're seeing now. Um, this image shows Frida's mother fully dressing the Tijuana tradition, revealing Frida's relationship with this dress um, long before meeting Rivera. So here we see how Frida circles her mom dressed in this traditional attire and writes, Mama Matilde Calderon, 1890. Um, so, you know, so by the time she decides to wear this dress, not only she chooses a dress that symbolizes a powerful woman, 
um, or you know, address that, help her convey her political beliefs or her Mexicanidad. But it was a dress that would take her back to her mother, to her mother's roots. So, yeah. So here, um, so here, let me show. I mean, a photograph by Bernard Silverstein that shows Frida wearing this specific um, Wipil Grande or Resplandor. So this starch lace headdress was typically worn by women of, of the Tehuantepec Isthmus back in the 18th and 19th centuries. And they usually would wear them for festive occasions like uh, weddings, saints days, and processions. I mean, this specific piece could be worn two ways, framing the face or as a cape. So, so Sir C, can I ask just a question? I understand. I understand that you were married in such a resplandor headdress. Yes, exactly. But I, I, I wore it more as a cape. And Carlo usually likes it in the more dramatic style, which is framing her face, as we will see in the other. Is like this is fascinating. So, um, so Ganita, as we were um, discussing, while fra while um, Carlo frequently dressed in in the Tawana dress, there are few examples of her wearing this specific resplandor piece, and she painted herself in the resplandor twice. So here we see an example of 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 the piece that we have in the collection. We have two. Um, and Carlos version is made of, of three kinds of white lace trimmed with either pink ribbon or lilac ribbon. Um, in this in this slide, we pair, and, and also in the exhibition, we pair this, this piece with Carlos self-portrait 1948, and where we see her, as we were discussing, framing her, her face. Um, you will see this, this, this painting in the exhibition, um, which is very exciting. And this painting was dedicated to her dentist, Samuel Fachlecht. So, yeah. Yeah. As Samuel Fachlecht's daughter told me that um, um, he was very, very eager to receive a, a self-portrait from Kahlo, but he begged her not to make it a sad one because he said he couldn't bear to see her sad. When she brought the finished painting to him, he looked and saw the three pearl-like tears. And then he looked at Kahlo, who apologized and said, I'm sorry, Dr. Sito, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, so, Circe, can we move to talk about the theme of disability that is so central to the show and also, of course, in Kahlo's life and art? Yeah. Um, yes, the disability aspect of the wardrobe, Ganit, is very, very, it's a very, very important part um, that will inform Carlos construction of identity. Um, Carlos traces of trauma and the hidden disparity between her right and left leg are evident through all her shoes, as we can see um, on this slide. So she had fall, uh, polio at the age of six. And she then suffered an almost fatal accident at the age of 18. So these two events would inform her wardrobe as much as, it, as they would inform um, her art later on. And so as a, as a result of the polio, she was left with a withered and, and shorter right leg. And this is something that led her to choose long skirts to cover her leg when, when, when she was little. And from a very young age, she began wearing three to four socks on her thinner calf and also wore shoes with um, build up heel to mask the asymmetry also shown in, in this um, photograph. Um, so this shows how she established a close relationship between her body and, and dress from a very, very early age. Um, um, Ganit, at the age of 18, when Carla was traveling in a bus coming back from her uh, from school, this bus collided with a tramway, and after this accident, she was confined to her bed for almost a year. 
So this was the beginning of the career of a great artist, but also the beginning of the deterioration of her body. Can you explain us a little bit more about this important drawing? Sure. Um, this pencil drawing, which we're very excited to have on display at the De Young, uh, was created by Kahlo just one year after the accident, so a kind of anniversary drawing. And you can notice that the entire composition, composition is dominated by duality. The top half of the drawing is a narrative illustration of the external events of the day. We see the bus and the tram colliding. The ground is strewn with bodies of those who were killed in the accident. But in contrast, and employing very different visual language and different scale, in the foreground, we see Kahlo visualizing the personal experience, the psychological experience. We see two Fridas, and this is the first time we see this kind of doubling. One Frida is the bandaged figure lying on a stretcher. Her, um, the accident injured Kahlo's uh, right leg, arm, spinal column, and perhaps most horrifically, uh, the metal handrail snapped off the bus and penetrated her body, entering through her abdomen and exiting through her vagina. And with a kind of morbid humor, she used to tell people, I lost my virginity. So above this horizontally, seemingly lifeless body of the wounded Kahlo, she draws a portrait of her head, a thinking self that separates from the injured body. Uh, and this is a kind of illumination of a psychological coping mechanism called splitting that is, very com that is a common response to life-threatening trauma. And just think, she, she wasn't an artist yet. She was just a 19-year-old trying to um, come to terms with her experiences. Um, and this duality, division, depiction of multiple selves uh, came to dominate Kahlo's imagery. Um, in the next slide, Circe, uh, we see a painting that she made 20 years later in response to spinal fusion operation in New York. She calls the work Tree of Hope Stand Firm. And you notice that here too, we see the injured Kahlo lying down on a hospital gurney, very vulnerable, blood oozing out of the surgical incisions on her back. And next to her, we see the upright Kahlo, erect, dressed and adorned in full Tewana regalia, expressing resilience and hope in the face of medical challenges. And this kind of duality she often expresses in the landscape, and it's echoed here uh, with the division of sun and moon, uh, night and day. So Circe and I also brought comparisons to share with you um, that these illuminate how Kahlo constructed her paintings, sort of the way she constructed her identity and constructed her look. But in this painting, she integrates uh, an image of her actual corsets, her actual Tijuana costumes, and photographs. And she just merges them all into a painting. And also, these are the type of objects that you will see put together in the exhibition uh, as envisioned by Circe. Yeah, uh, wow. Again, it is always so nice to listen to you talk about Carlos' art. We always learn so much. Thank you for that um, very nice uh, explanation. Um, so now we will move on to this photograph of, of Carlo. Um, you know, it's very interesting because a lot of people I talked to didn't even realize Frida was severely, severely disabled in different periods of her life or that she was confined to a wheelchair even. I mean, she spent a lot of time sitting and painted herself sitting as we just saw in, in, Tree, of, in Tree of Hope. Um, so her adoption of this dress was a conscious decision, of course, and both distracting and purposeful. So 
but if you see the composition of the dress, um, it's it's also a very very important part I wanted to point out. So the heavily adorned and fragmented composition of of, of the traditional Tehuana dress would allow Frida to establish a relationship between this specific dress and her own body geometry. So if you see, the stylistic attire draws focus from the torso up. So this dress is composed of three parts, a long skirt, which is called the enagua, a short geometric blouse called the huipil, and lastly, a hairstyle composed of braiding and flowers. So the composition of the Tewana dress served to keep the viewer's attention focused on the upper part of her body, distracting them from her wounded legs. So almost as if she intentionally wanted to crop herself from, from the torso up. And we see many paintings where she frames herself this way. Um, and for example, the fact that the Wipil is a short tunic, as we can see in this photograph, uh, means that while she is sitting, the wipil does increase. So she looks like a queen, uh, whether she is sitting or whether she's standing. Yeah, so now that um, you were just mentioning the the, the corsets, um, in these photos, we see how Kahlo decorated and adorned her corsets. And I think Kahlo transformed these medical courses into items of great, great beauty. So Frida's relationship to the corset, of course, is one of support and need, her body dependent on, on medical attention. But far from allowing the corset to define her as an invalid, Kahlo decorated and adorned these corsets, making them appear as, as an explicit choice. Um, she included them in, 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 you know, in the construction of her looks, as an essential piece and, and almost as a second skin, almost as if she was painting a blouse. And um, so she would cover them under her beautiful Tijuana dresses, but also uncover them through her art. That's right. And I wanted to use this specific slide, with your permission, Circe, to um, address briefly the ethical curatorial position that you articulated and that we all follow. Um, the objects at the de Young Museum are very intimate and personal, but uh, the curatorial decisions actually are very respectful and follow Kahlo's lead. We always show only what Kahlo herself decided to reveal to us. And, um, these plaster corsets uh, show how uh, Kahlo transformed um, corsets into art. In the next slide, we see how she also painted the corsets um, and incorporated them in her painting. Um, the next slide of um, very powerful painting, The Broken Column, also shows what Circe just said, that even in her paintings, she decides to cover up uh, her body from the waist down. Um, Circe, you want to talk a little bit about this incredible painting? Yeah, I mean, well, here here we see um, um, a bare-breasted Kahlo and how she depicts herself as injured, but defiant. She wears an orthopedic corset, as you were saying, similar to the ones um, um, all of you will be able to, to see in the exhibition. And, um, and Kahlo conceals and reveals constantly through, through her wardrobe and the art. And these relationships will be also highlighted in the exhibition, as, as Ganit was, was explaining. So at this point, it's important for me to highlight that disability in this specific show is shown as possibility. And... I feel and, and think that Kahlo used painting to examine experiences of illness, disability, and, and pain, but also articulated her own resilience and capacity to create meaning and, of course, joy and beauty and, and art. So, so, so that's very, very important to point out um, that you know, we're bringing in this exhibition. 
So now I would like to move on to to this beautiful drawing. So before we we talk about other aspects of Carlos' life and her time in San Francisco, I want to share this um, very intimate drawing with you called Appearances Can Be Deceiving, which is the title of the show in San Francisco. And it's a, um, a drawing that also was discovered at the Blue House. Um, this drawing is basically the genesis of this project. In the drawing, we can see Carlos' layers of identity. She shows us her layers of identity. We see her naked. She presents us with her naked body, wearing her corset. Then we see her spine represented with a crumbling column. We see her with her right leg significantly thinner than the left leg, and the left leg has butterflies. She sometimes uses um, wings and butterflies as symbols of freedom and, and health. Then we see very clearly the silhouette of Carlos de Buena's costume as camouflage covering her body. And then she reiterates to us her visual message in her own words, appearances can be deceiving. So for me, I mean, fra um, you know, Carlos' layers of identity are presented here not as nostalgia, but as a personal manifesto. So, Ganit, so we can um, now move on to the next slides. And we just spoke about the relationship between Carlos and her mother. And we know her relationship with her father was very special. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Sure, sure, uh, Circe. So, um, Kahlo is very, very close to her father, and she was, by all accounts, his favorite daughter. Wilhelm uh, Kahlo, the father, was of Hungarian-German origins. He immigrated to Mexico at the age of 18, uh, at the end of the 19th century. And in Mexico, as a young man, he changed his name to Guillermo and became a very, very important architectural photographer who documented Mexico's historical and mo modern art, uh, sites. Uh, both Kahlo and her friends uh, say that he always remained an outsider. He was immersed in German culture and always spoke to the end, spoke uh, Spanish with a very heavy uh, German uh, accent. So we see on the right a self-portrait of Herr Kahlo, as Frida liked to call him in jest. And we see that he displays himself as an artist photographer. Very interestingly, uh, 10 years after his death, Kahlo based a portrait of her father, which we see on the left, on his own self-depiction. In the caption, she emphasizes aspect of, aspects of his identity that link the two together. Um, he was an artist. He was a sick man who overcame his illness. And both of them had a penchant for disc, uh, explorations of the self. In the next uh, two slides, we see two more self-portraits by Guillermo Kahlo, discovered in 2004. You know, he captures himself nude or as a worker intellectual surrounded by his uh, German classical, by the German classics. Um, so she learned about self-portraiture. Another lesson she learned from him was how to strike a pose. From a very, very early age and persistently throughout her life, she posed for photographers, she posed for photographs, she composed her image with care and attention to detail, and um, this is something that you will see throughout the show. Now, um, Circe and I thought to share with you one of the rarely seen paintings that we actually have in the show that provides insight into Kahlo's understanding her, of her process of growing up and can sort of sum up what we've just discussed so far. The painting is called Memory. And here we see Kahlo once again divided, this time into three personae, and all of them fragmented. 
So the central Kahlo figure is handless, so helpless, divided between land and sea. She wears a very atypical white skirt and a leather bolero jacket, and her hair, you know, is kind of short and permed, very different from the iconic image we, for which she's famous. We see that her foot is deformed, alluding to her bout with polio, and a rail penetrates her torso, referencing the accident. What's interesting is that she explicitly shows us how she chooses her fashion, she chooses her garments as a way of choosing an identity. Here she relinquishes the little girl's European school uniform and engages, embraces the adult woman's Tijuana costume. So she illustrates the choice that Circe talked about earlier in our conversation. So, wow, always so fascinating. So, Ganit, now we will talk a little bit about um, Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera and their marriage. Um, Kahlo grew up and then at the age of 22, she married Diego Rivera. He was 43 years old and he was one of the most famous artists in Mexico and internationally. Um, shortly after their marriage, they traveled to the United States or Gringolandia, as she used to call um, the U.S. And they lived in San Francisco, New York, and Detroit for the for the next three years. Is that correct? Yes, three years. So, can you tell us a little bit about her time in San Francisco? Sure. Sure. It was very, very influential. The whole trip from 1930 to 33 was extremely important for Kahlo's development uh, as a young woman and as an artist. Um, so Rivera, as you said, was a world famous artist celebrity and he was invited to paint murals in San Francisco and Kahlo accompanied him. This was her very first time outside of Mexico. And she was very, very excited and enthusiastic. Um, I was fortunate to be one of the first scholars to have access to letters that she wrote to her family and friends from San Francisco. She wrote several letters each day. And these letters reveal how she responded kind of with childlike glee to the first time she saw the ocean, to the first time she visited Chinatown, the ethnic diversity of San Francisco. She loved everything she saw. And what we find interesting is that she began to develop her own voice, her unique sartorial style, and also she began to paint more seriously. Um, we see that she wrote her mother, and I quote, uh, the gringas really like me a lot and take notice of all the dresses and rebosos that I brought with me. Their jaws drop at the sight of my jade necklaces and all the painters want me to pose for them. Um, she actually posed for photographers, not painters, as we see in the next slide, and defined herself as the Tijuana with heavy Aztec beans, beads, long skirts, rebosos, which are the uh, shawls. And I find it really, really interesting that she embraced her Mexican identity um, and this fashion, specifically when she was far away from her homeland. And she really relished uh, being special and different and in the limelight. And it was a new experience for her. Um, I said before that it was in San Francisco that she painted more seriously, and uh, we have many of the portraits she painted in San Francisco in the exhibition. Um, here is uh, what was her first serious or a major painting. Uh, and I call it the marriage portrait, uh, and it's the first painting that where should we see her. Uh, dressed, fully dressed in a Tijuana. So this is the first painting of Frida Kahlo, self-image as a Tijuana. And 
I want you to notice that Diego Rivera is painted as the great artist. The palette and brushes are in his hand. And Kahlo, you know, the painter of this work, contrasts herself and presents herself merely as the little Mexican wife. And she also adopts a kind of pseudo-naive style to this painting. Mm, yes, absolutely. Look at her um, wearing this red rebozo and how demure she looks here. So what, ha what happened next? What happened next? Well, Carla loved San Francisco and also enjoyed New York, where she made a lot of friends. But when Rivera was commissioned to paint a mural cycle at the Detroit Institute of Art, the couple moved to Detroit in the spring of 1932. Kala was absolutely miserable. Uh, this was compounded and complicated by the fact that soon after their arrival, she found out that she was pregnant. Her first response was to try to abort the pregnancy, as she had done with previous two previous pregnancies but the abortion apparently failed. And her letters reveal that she began to tentatively consider keeping the baby and having uh, the child by cesarean se uh, section. And, you know, as she was trying to wrap her hand head around all of this, um, on July 4th, 1932, she had a traumatic miscarriage and almost bled to death. So, Still in the hospital, she began to paint and draw and make art that was dramatically different from the portraits she had painted just one year earlier. And, you know, if you said earlier that the accident at age 18 uh, transformed her into uh, an artist, I think the miscarriage and what happened afterwards made her into the innovative, taboo-breaking artist that we know today. So we have a dramatic shift. Um, we brought, uh, to show you, a lithograph that Kahlo made uh, in August of 32, so barely a month after she nearly died and had this miscarriage. And this is her first and only known lithograph, which really tackles an unprecedented theme of the experience of a miscarriage. So here she takes off the Tijuana costume and exposes her most intimate experience. Instead of a wife standing by her husband, she stands naked, vulnerable, all alone, a divided self. We see vaginal blood drops, unborn fetuses, um, really things that are not often seen in art, especially not in 1932. And all these uh, are evidence of her inability to procreate. But while that part of herself failed, the right side of the composition displays the fecundity of nature that is ongoing. And here she used some Aztec sources to uh, compose the plants. And even more uh, importantly, I think, we see that she grows a third arm like a Hindu deity. And in this hand, she holds the painter's palette. And if we look at the detail, we see that this is the very same palette that had belonged to Rivera just one year earlier. So unable to give birth to a child, she gives birth to herself and is reborn an artist. Mm. This is so fascinating. And definitely she's, she's someone who has always been ahead of her, her time. So no? <laughs> wow, Gany, thank you so much for, for that amazing explanation. So now we will move on to briefly show you some of the relationships between her wardrobe, her paintings, and photographs that Ganit was mentioning previously. Um, this photo was taken by Nicholas Murray, 
and we have been talking about Nicholas Murray previously. We saw some of his photographs as well. And um, he was a Hungarian photographer that immigrated to the U.S. in 1913. He became one of the leading commercial um, portrait photographers in, in, in the U.S. And he was introduced to Kahlo in 1931 in Mexico by artist Miguel Covarrubias that we also uh, saw when we saw the photograph of my, of my family. And... Nicolas Moret had a relationship, a very close relationship with Kahlo and a romantic relationship even for nearly 10 years. So he took a series of color carbon prints um, of, of Frida Kahlo that revealed the way she used to style her clothes. And he used to say that color calls for a new way of looking at people and looking at things. And... This also gave us a lot of information about, about um, Carlos sartorial choices. So here we see the care she puts to compose her look from her magenta rebozo to the flowers in her hair and the use of list, the lipstick and nail varnish. So this photograph was taken by, by him in his New York studio after Carlos returned from, from uh -huh. Paris, from her show after showing um, her work in this group show called Mixi, organized by Andre Breton in 1939. Right. And um, even though they, um, when Kahlo received this photograph, um, she and uh, Nick had broken off their intimate relationship. Um, it was her very favorite photograph and she responded uh, to Nick in a wonderful, wonderful, ecstatic letter. And she wrote to him, you will always be under the magenta rebozo on the left side, close to my heart. And they remained friends for, yeah. for a long, so, long time. So beautiful. So now we move on to this fresco and necklace. Um, while Diego Rivera was painting a series of movable, movable frescoes um, in New York, his assistant brought Kahlo a prepared fresco panel with paints and, and, and brushes so that Kahlo could experiment a little bit with, with, with the fresco painting. So Kahlo composed this portrait of herself wearing a greenstone necklace. But it's interesting because, according to Lucien Bloch, um, Kahlo was quite disgusted. She really didn't like the result of, of this um, portrait. She thought it was very ugly. And, and I think Kahlo even broke the fresco and wanted to throw it in, in the trash. But, um, but Bloch saved it from, from, from the destruction. And, um, and we have this amazing piece in the show. And I have to confess, this is the first time I ever, I, I ever see this, 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 this fresco. And next to it, we see um, one of Kahlo's bead necklaces. So we don't have record of where she acquired these this beads. Um, but they signal Kahlo's ongoing interest in Prehispanic art. And her husband, Diego Rivera, was also a collector of these objects. So, you know, we think maybe he helped um, her acquire them or something. So this necklace appears in many photographs. Um, um, of, of the artist and also in different paintings. And, and there are even traces of green paint in some of, of, of its stones. So this suggests that she would mix paints to match um, um, the green hues for some of her canvases. So when you come to the exhibition, look for this specific necklace so you can see this beautiful detail. This is fascinating. Um, the next slide, here we see an example of, um, of this necklaces, gold chain necklaces called torsales. And these torsales are usually made out of gold and the Tijuana love to wear them and because these necklaces in, in, Oaxaca, in Oaxaca, when the Tijuana uh, wear them, um, it's a way of displaying um, a, a, a family's wealth. 
So so here, yeah, so here we see her um, wearing them and again sitting. And, and Ganit, can you tell us a little bit about this? Page? Right. We see these tosales in uh, photographs as well. And in this uh, painting, it's Quintly Dog and Me, we see uh, Kahlo posing, you know, as a regal Tijuana and wearing these dosales. Uh, I was always struck by her um, kind of straight back and uh, upright pose. And it was Silse who told me that she probably has a corset underneath that beautiful wipil, which we, I, I think we also have that in the show, right, uh, Circe? Yes. We do. That's, yeah, that's great. So you'll be able to compare the painting with the actual garment. Um, and um, she, the It's Quintly Dog is a hairless uh, native Mexican dog. One of her pets, she had many dogs and spider monkeys and parrots and other birds and even a pet fawn, uh, which roamed around in La Casa Azul in the Blue House. Um, we have an entire section uh, in the show devoted to the Blue House, which she um, she composed, you know, like she composed her paintings and her dress and her fashion, and she posed for photographs. She also uh, made her, created her home as a kind of microcosmos of Mexico. So while in It's Quintly Dog and Me, we see Kahlo as the iconic Tijuana, in other paintings she explores alternative identities. Actually, I think she's one of the first artists to teach us that identity is not a static or monolithic given, but that it shifts and changes, and sometimes we have many simultaneous intersectional identities. And she always, often used clothes and hairdos to perform other identities. And in the slide that you see, she shows herself as a gender fluid persona. Uh, in the photograph on the right, taken by her father, the 19 year old Kala wears a man's three piece suit. She poses with a walking stick like a ma male dandy. And on the left, we see her self portrait with cropped hair where she actively modifies her look. She lops off the Tijuana braids and long hair and puts on another identity by putting on a man's suit. So we, she explored gender ident, uh, fluidity and Circe and I always joke that she did so decades before the term even existed. Um, she was so complex, extremely bold and way ahead of her time. Um, shall we move to the final painting, Circe? Sure, yes. So the final painting we chose to share with you is also on view at the de Young. And here we see Kahlo uh, with one of her pet monkeys. Uh, the monkeys, as I said, were her pets, but also like surrogate children, ancient ancestors, um, alter egos and the connection we see because she and the monkey wear um, matching ribbons in their hair. Um, there's so much more to say, but we wanted to end with a quote by Alejandro Gomez Arias, Carlos high school sweetheart and lifelong friend. And Circe, I think you should have the last word. So do you mind reading this quote for us? Okay, I will. Um, who was Frida Kahlo? It is not possible to find an exact answer. So contradictory and multiple was the personality of this woman that it may be said that many Fridas existed. Perhaps none of them was the one she wanted to be. And with this quote, yes, we would like to finish. Thank you so much. Thank you, Circe and Gannett, for that lovely presentation. We learned that Frida filled her world with the traditional crafts and artwork of Mexico. One of those traditions was the small 
devotional narrative painting known as the Ex Voto. If you go to the Casa Sul, be on the lookout for Frida's beautiful collection of Ex Votos. My name is Rafael Naz. Today I'm going to guide you through the process of making your very own Ex Voto. I'm going to go over the materials, and while you gather them, let's learn about this magical living tradition. Here's what you'll need. Paper and pencil. Some cardboard. An utility knife. A ruler. And whatever it is you want to color it with. Paints. Pencils. Pastels. Whatever you have works. I also used a little of this absorbent ground because I'm going to paint my ex voto with water-based paints today. You can also use a flat house paint. That works great too. The ex voto has been a popular Mexican tradition for hundreds of years. These small devotional narrative paintings were usually done on metal. Let's have a look at some from my collection. Traditionally, these are gratitude paintings for having survived a calamitous event. They usually tell the story in pictures and words in the form of a prayer. We can see what almost happened to the person in this one here. And at the top, they've included the story in the form of a prayer. This one just has a photograph at the top, with the prayer next to it. There were even traveling artists known as ex voteros who would sell unfinished ex votos to people who wanted to make one but didn't have the means to. They would paint generic pictures of people praying and leave lots of blank space at the bottom for the person to include their story or prayer. Okay, are you ready to start your ex voto? Let's start with steps number one and two. Step number one, Using your utility knife or heavy scissors, cut the piece of cardboard that you want to use. And step number two, paint your cardboard white. You can use flat acrylic house paint or something like this absorbent ground. That way you can paint on it with water-based paints and it'll all work out fine. Okay, step three, now that your cardboard is dry, use your ruler to draw lines at the bottom of your picture. That's where your words are going to go. Of course, if you're going to leave a different space for your words, then just put them in there. Next, using your sketch pad, Copy your lines in the same place as your cardboard. It's a good idea to use a sketch pad that's the same size as your cardboard. That way when you practice your drawing and you want to transfer it, it's the same and it's the same size. So you're not going to cut anything off. So I like to also prepare my paper in the same way, draw my lines in the same space. That way I know just how much I have left to draw.
Okay, we've prepared our cardboard. We have some sketch paper that's roughly the same size and orientation as our cardboard. Now it's time to get started on our drawing. I would highly recommend you start first from your memory. Just put down sh the shapes that you think are important. Afterwards, you can go back and pick up your, your phone or your computer to find images to fill in the details. But it's most important that you start from what you remember because that's really the story to tell, not all the details. When I make an X photo, it's usually to honor an unexplainable event. I want to memorialize a special moment in pictures and words and put it in a painting. Let me show you an X photo I made recently. It was just before St. Patrick's Day and here in San Francisco, all the businesses were closed due to the pandemic. I was walking down my street, passing a bookstore, when I spied the book written by an old friend of mine in the window. I took a photograph and emailed it to him. But I promptly heard back from his assistant that just that week he had passed away due to old age. My sadness was balanced by the feeling of him near. It was as if he was stopping over to say goodbye one last time. So I made this painting for him. Here's a picture of me. Here's a photograph of the book in the window. And I included a rainbow. This was at a time when a lot of people were making pictures of rainbows, symbols of hope in dark times. And guess what? Recently, the bookstore reopened. So I went back and I bought the book. Here it is, Patrick. Patron Saint of Ireland by Tommy De Paola. I worked on some of these backgrounds. Thanks, Tommy. I hope this gives you some ideas for the kind of X photo you might make. Let's have a look and see what you can make now. There's the beginnings of my X photo. You can see some people sitting around a table, some lines at the bottom. I'll tell you the story really quick. I was at my partner's mom's house for Christmas a few years ago and we were all sitting around the kitchen table when suddenly his mom started singing a song directly to me. She sang the whole song. She was in her 80s and had quite an amazing voice. It was a special moment for me and when I asked about it later, it turns out that she sang to all of her sons. So it really made me feel like part of the family after that. That's the painting I'm going to make today. Okay, now that we have our rough sketch, we're going to transfer it onto our cardboard. Since we did a rough sketch, um, you should make some refinements as you put it onto your cardboard. But if you're going to paint it, don't, you don't have to be too detailed in your, in your drawing because you're going to paint over it anyways. I hope that hearing my stories and seeing my process has given you some good ideas for the story that you need to paint or that you want to start. Um, I'm going to start with some watercolors, I think, some actually some gouache, which are transparent, uh, sorry, opaque watercolors. Got here some lovely gouache paints. But, you know, you can use anything you want. You can use uh, some pastels or crayons. You can use some colored pencils. Colored pencils are great because they're kind of got a sharp point. I like, uh, I like paint though because I can spread big areas really quickly. 
um, and easily. So I hope this has been a lot of fun making a uh, start on your Exvoto, and I hope that uh, next time I see you, you'll have a beautiful finished painting to put on your wall and remember something really special that happened for you.
I'm going to keep working on my X photo, and I hope today gave you a good start on yours. And lastly, from all of us, thanks for your participation today and for your continued support of the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. We'd love to see your creations. Tag them on social media at hashtag deyoungsters. So long. <laughs>